What's worth a video? Hello and welcome to this recap of our webinar on integrating video in primarily written publishing. This discussion was part of our Creative Europe funded journalism partnership project that's called Come Together. This conversation is primarily focused on video reportage, that is video as independent content. However, we also talked a bit about video as a promotion tool. And here's the guest of this discussion, videographer Gergely Papai. Hello and thank you for having me here. I'm Gergő Pápai. With my work, I'm focusing on uh, human rights and uh, environmental issues. And I work together with uh, NGOs and a watchdog journal, co journal called uh, Adlatso. Gergely is a cultural anthropologist who works as an applied videographer by day and works on his own documentaries by night. Recently, he's been getting into producing silent films, which he accompanies with live electronical music at in-person screenings. It's great to have you. So shall I continue? Please go ahead, take it away. So I thought I come up with some topics which often happens when clients are uh, like calling me. The first thing is like, I think there's no need for a video all the time. I, <laughs> seriously, I'm sorry for saying this, but sometimes a photo or a Facebook post, maybe a podcast without picture, just like a better solution. Video is really a magic tool, I think, but only if there is content for that, like visually appealing and like you have the energy to, to edit it and figure out all the details and the thing what you want to communicate with the video, you can figure out what's the purpose of it. Otherwise, it's just better not to make a video sometimes. Sometimes you have to brave enough just not to make a video or something like that. The archetypal bad choices, the like typically bad choices to waste money on video for, because I think at the root of this is that video is costly and very like resource heavy, right? Also very time consu consuming, even from the client side, I guess. Yeah. Because like if a video person like me is dropped into, into something for the client it's uh it's very time consuming to bring me into the into the topic so it takes time and this video documentation i think it can be a solution but like only if the topic is interesting at least for the community it's also important to figure out the, the genre of the video i mean short one or long documentation i think we really have to figure out what kind of audience and uh, how they are going to pay attention on our content. I think a few years ago, everybody was talking about that, like videos should be short. Recently, the trend is people don't watch television, they're watching internet and like listening podcasts. So the videos doesn't have to be short. If it is interesting, it, it can be even super long. They, we don't have time limits anymore. We have a couple of social media professionals in the call who can tell us more about their experience. But what what we've seen recently is that a certain type or number of videos get exponentially shorter. But there's also something in the other yeah, yeah, end yeah, of yeah. the spectrum that that content gets longer and more in depth. Yes. And especially amongst young people, they do consume a lot of long form, like in depth, like video essays and podcasts. Right. We started to make. Uh... Uh, very long. We call it podcast, but it looks nice. And we use several cameras in it. I don't even know why I'm calling it podcast, but it became very popular. They are like way more than one hour long uh, discussion. We, we just uh, realized that if it is longer and more detailed, and we just have more viewers on it. On YouTube, I think the audience, mostly like more than 70% of them are male in general, and they are interested in technical details and they they stay with the, with the content, even if it is very long. I don't know much about TikTok and uh, this super short uh, world of uh, videos, but I think we have to talk about a very different audience. I mean, Instagram and Facebook maybe have very different uh, audience, so we have to think about this. But I think you, YouTube can hold up very long videos. The question is, what is the purpose of the video? Whether it's like to promote uh, print publishing, like in Kritikas or Gerador's case. Videos for journals. I think YouTube is more suitable 
and we don't have to be afraid of producing long content because we are not losing the audience if the content is uh, has a certain depth if the content is good talking about the cost if the content is nice i mean in the terms of like producing videos for journals i think we have we can keep uh, keep things simple we don't have to invest into a uh, uh, set necessarily i mean and we still don't lose the audience because uh, audience is using long video content as it was a podcast so it's basically like listening to the radio while yeah like what driving we, what we are doing together with standard time i mean like it looks really nice and we put a lot of energy in it and it has animated inserts and so on i think many people are using it as as a podcast So what we've seen with standard time and the statistics, which kind of surprised me, well, it didn't surprise me that the majority of the audience is above 45, because my core audience has always been like 50 plus. That's just a personality thing, I think. But uh, a lot of people watch it uh, on smart TV. We don't yet have uh, detailed statistics from Display Europe this uh, content sharing platform that this production is for. So I'm only talking about YouTube statistics and Eurozine's own statistics. Uh, Smart TV was not even on my mental radar as a device to watch it on. Uh, A good portion of people watch it on PC, which is completely against everything you believe because, you know, you just assume that this is going to be streamed from phone. Um, But there is also a podcast version, which we were heavily encouraged to do because a lot of people are not going to sit in front of a long talk format. And I'll be honest with you, for my attention span, it's too much sitting in one place. And so it's probably also like uh, viewers have it, right? Yes, if it is the future of uh, of uh, uh, journalism, the video making, I think it's related to this, uh, this trend of like people are not sitting and reading anymore, but like they are constantly listening to or watching something in the background. Let's talk about conference videos, though. Um, conference video was all the rage. Everybody wanted to record every God-given conference. What's your advice? Do conference videos work? Are they needed? Are they useful? I mean, if the resources are limited, I think it's better not to do documentation, but uh, make with the keynote speakers, most important characters about the most important topic, short interview. I think in general, just documentation without some strategy of how to output it or publish it. I don't know if it makes any sense. It's also related to the quality of the conference by itself. This uh, video documentation part, usually the part of the, I don't know, the project. And when they apply money for it, they just uh, put video documentation in it. And the client is facing with a situation when they did not put enough energy on post-production, then you have to make a lot of decisions like this topic is important and this one is not. This is a, a very big task for even the clients. And sometimes it still doesn't make any sense. I would recommend if someone is doing video documentation about conference, they must have a strategy before we start shooting. I mean, it's also the question if it is live or not. Many people cannot be there in person. That's a practical thing. But if you want to go further and want to make several video outputs, they have to be well figured out, I think. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that I, I believe that that this field has changed significantly. Myself have worked on, and I see a lot of video documentation of events and talks, sometimes very professionally produced, that gather, you know, 200, 300 views, which doesn't really seem to be worth the effort. But this statement goes completely against the sort of literary tradition of creating, archiving, this sort of Zamlung uh, logic of, of accumulating knowledge, accumulating resources, and then boiling it down into something. And yet, um, my impression is that there really isn't a shortage of worthwhile content out there. It's more the case that you have to struggle to find an audience. 15 years ago, when we put out a video, the video itself was kind of an event because you had three of them in a month or less or something like this. Right now, just having an additional video doesn't really have the same kind of value, doesn't really garner the same kind of attention. So it might be a better choice if it's either specifically arranged in a way 
that is for the camera, or if it's more like an addition, either a teaser or a reminder or a promotion kind of something, because the conference talk, um, even if it's the most exciting panel discussion ever, that's just not arranged for visibility, like per se. And it makes for kind of a tough situation to make it visually interesting, to make it feel like you're really in on the discussion. I think series do work. If you make one video of the panel, panel discussion, it probably doesn't work. You have to think about film production as a series of something. Then you will have audience, which is coming back to your platform again and again. Even if it is a series of conference panel discussion, it's very cost effective because uh, the visual elements and the uh, inserts, video inserts, and the workflow by itself becomes way more cost efficient. But on the other hand, we will bring you an uh, audience. It has to be a podcast. It has to be, I don't know, some sort of talking head discussion. So it has to look like an existing uh, genre style. Yeah. One of my, my favorite instances of investigative journalism uh, and data visualization on videos by Daniel Ash when he was like investigating a, a whole sort of uh, parking fee mafia in one of the Budapest districts. And they didn't have the money or the expertise to do these like big old uh, animations and whatever. So he took a bunch of like straight chalk and drew the whole sort of network of interconnected uh, firms and whatnots on the sidewalk, right where the story was happening. And I think uh, these are the kinds of sort of small ticks that everybody can operate with, can find them within their own genre. What are these sort of tiny, very personal, very sort of talking shop type of effects that you can use um, to make, say, a, a complex or abstract story sort of tangible. Maybe we can ask our social media people on the call about their experiences, because you all have mentioned that you've worked with uh, significantly shorter content and specifically in promoting existing publishing. That, that sounds quite exciting. Actually, right now, a form of an Instagram reel is like the easiest way to attract people and to capture people's attention. It's also the best way to capture attention of people who are outside of your bubble people who do not follow you on instagram because you know like people use uh, reels the way people use right now tiktok so it's like scrolling and not necessarily watching content that you follow instagram really promotes this form because it's right now competing with tiktok what we did is we started to watch tiktok trends and try to adapt TikTok's form. Uh, at first, we were uh, recording our uh, videos and editing them via TikTok and then like sending it to Instagram without a watermark. It worked. Like the main problem uh, is that people watch reels for watching reels. So it's not necessarily sending people to your to, like website. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes even if it's, um, like an introduction to an article, you have to explain to the journalist that it's like this person might not read your article. So like watching a video equals reading an article. And that's the way it is nowadays. And the second challenge is that, yeah, so sometimes you just want to make an introduction to the article or to the book, but this is not the way you attract uh, attention. You need to ask a question, produce something really interesting and then like give the satisfaction very quickly, like after 30 seconds, for example, or like even quicker, even quicker. The satisfaction must be there because otherwise the video will be annoying and the person, people will avoid your videos. I think like the coolest thing about Instagram Reels is like it's showing the faces of journalists. Then they can asso associate some kind of topics to their faces. It's actually it's the only mean to attract younger readers who doesn't know you. And uh, yeah, they might just uh, find you by, by a chance and get attracted and stay with you longer. My very unprofessional opinion about this is uh, Instagram story and TikTok, maybe it's a little bit overrated. You can have a lot of clicks. You have to create uh, content constantly. Uh, the content has to be high quality because there is a big race for uh, audience. 
and the whole uh, whole seeing the whole platform is very clickbait anyway. Also, in, like in reaction to what Adriana is saying, we have a very similar experience. Although mine is much limited in short form, I've done a little, but um, also like across a longer time. Obviously, we have been working on this model of what I like to call like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs in everything that's promotion and infotainment. So in, in my hand, you know, let's talk about an archetypal uh, sort of continuum of getting information or insight or analysis to more and more people. So you have like a research paper. Um, the research paper is then, well, not promoted, but there is like a uh, an essay for one of our cultural journals um, published on, on the on the findings of the research that is tailored to a wider lay audience, but still requires you to have some kind of previous knowledge, education, interest, etc. Um, then the sort of this authoritative essay is boiled a bit further down um, into like shorter form, like I, I don't know, like a news report or something of the sort. And then you can sort of go through all of these genres that that try to require less and less energy investment uh, from the reader, viewer, user. Um, but you can't really imagine this as like a direct pathway that everybody's going to embark on. Basically what we're doing is that we're leaving this kind of trail of breadcrumbs for a fragment of the audience to follow up, follow through on. And you, you properly cite your sources and you build this pathway hoping for those few to actually follow up on so that they actually find something. Now, this is a workable model, in my opinion. This is a model that used to work in public service, for instance, for decades. Um, and it it's, was sometimes a really exciting experience for me to see that doing a, a sort of ironical radio show on social sciences, people would phone in because they didn't find the link to the reads for the next radio show, which is like not something I expected from my mainly pensioner audience. They were very devoted. But what I've seen is that the what we what social media managers would call the conversion rate. So the the ratio of people following through, clicking through, going through the next source is decreasing. And it's in large part the fault of the platforms because the platforms are tailoring everything. Now, Facebook, for instance, yeah. explicitly penalizing uh, external links, which is just insanity. And basically the complete opposite of what the internet was made for. Yes. Um, they are trying to keep you on the platform. So we are trying to build something against the current. And in my very sort of snap judgment, I would follow what Adriana says and say that Instagram reels or TikToks or YouTube shorts can be effective, but you have to measure what kind of energy or capacity you have. If all you have is capacity to do a couple of Instagram reels with like very quick sh snaps from like, I don't know, an editorial meeting or a field report, et cetera, it's worth it. It's not really worth it to do on top of like longer form, higher production value stuff. I did, but again, that's just my personal judgment. You wanted to react? No, no, thanks. I, I, I agree with you, and I'm confused. Uh, <laughs> like how? Like recently, I as as a professional friend of mine uh, who is in the music industry, where is the audience? How can you reach people if you are doing music? And she said, newsletter. I mean, like yeah. <laughs> I am 41 years old, and uh, and I. Like I thought newsletters are for boomers or I don't know what, but she said it's newsletters and I realized she was right. Any comments or questions or experiences to the contrary? Just to give you a feedback on the two things you said, um, I think it's interesting to see that the newsletter, as you said, is not only for boomers and that it has become almost like a, like a content in itself, you know, with a more personal way of writing the introduction. And um, I think it's probably a question of balance. I think videos can be interesting, sometimes very short, sometimes quite long. But it's, it's, it's interesting to see that in the media, we have fashionable items sometimes. Everybody follows it and everybody's trying to find podcasts, for example, is another good example where there's no incoming model at the moment. And and although, although I do listen to a lot of 
had your France, for example, postcards, which are very good. I think it's not nice to have a variety of possibilities to inform ourselves. So it's not one thing against the other. It's more like a the, the the right balance, the right mix. I would I would be interested to know whether anybody has maybe seen the short version, shorter version of our live events that we do publish in videos uh, on Vox Europe. I would be very interesting to have a feedback. Some of them are forty minutes, and some of them are sometimes even longer, like fifteen minutes or even an hour. I think when people are interested in one subject, they will look at it. No, we should check them out, and I think maybe this also talks uh, to the point that. Gerge made about series, building up series, building up an audience over a longer period of time. As you said, um, it's true, the conversion ratio from social media to our website, for example, is decreasing definitely. But I think I, I can agree with what was said about the reels that have to be high quality. That's the, the wonderful thing about reels. In my opinion, it, it doesn't have to be in very high quality. It rather is a decision to make by a, a media department because TikTok, TikTok and Instagram can be surprisingly forgiving when it comes to the quality of the sound and the image. The, I know very popular educational good content reels that are connected to some media departments and they are somehow quite bad quality, but the content is good. That's the most important thing. And that's why I think that the reels made for TikTok, for Instagram, for Facebook shorts um, are just these low cost pieces of journalism that we can send to the new audience. That's why it's just it's worth uh, worth doing these days, in my opinion. I totally yeah. agree. And I would say that also it creates this, first of all, intimacy. And second of all, the idea of uh, authenticity. And like right now we are facing the crisis of institutions and like journalism and in institutionalized journalism is one of them. Uh, when one of um, so like people stopped believing newsrooms, newspapers, because they consider them companies or corporations, etc. And started to believe YouTubers and uh, people talking on TikTok because like they have this notion of authenticity. I don't agree with that, but I can see this phenomenon in culture. So like producing content similar to that, it's a chance for us. Uh, it's like a chance to, to show um, people that, you know, like we are also authentic. We can produce a content having your cell phone and like it can get viral on the internet. So it's like a chance for us as well, but like, we have to imitate some trends that appear on TikTok. And like, if you do it, sometimes, yeah, you can get your new audience. I would also agree with the girls when it comes to the quality that even the apps like Instagram and TikTok themselves, they recommend not doing the highest quality. So not using a film crew to record, but just your camera. Of course, the sound has to be good and the subtitles has to be there. But like Kasia said, it's a very... Uh, it's a low-hanging fruit for us that can really gain new audience and keep the magazine relevant and modern because now, I don't know, if you want to see if a restaurant is worth going there, you go to their Instagram. If they're not on social media and they're not up to date with how the social media should look like, then they do not become relevant. I also... I am of the opinion that if there is a new platform where people go, then, then credible information and knowledge also has to appear there. We interviewed a, a very successful sex educator um, on the talk show that we do. Um, she's called uh, Dan, uh, Deni Marayutakis, and she does TikTok and Instagram, has over a million followers on the two platforms. And she, she's a medical doctor doing just poor sex education and talks about how this has to happen. If, if people are getting their information on TikTok, then there has to be credible information on TikTok. I completely agree. But what I wonder, and also with the points you're making about these formats being more forgiving, but I wonder whether you are creating a completely new audience and you have to stay on these platforms or whether you think that this audience will ever be channeled into your 
quote unquote original publishing or onto your um, previously existing publishing or this new sort of form of publishing has to be uh, maintained for them forever and they will remain separate. How do you feel about this? So it means that we address completely new people, especially younger. That's actually our goal is that people come to our web website and that our journalists are promoted and uh, uh, that people know that we talk about certain topics and we are associated with it. And also the second goal is so people go to our bookstore and buy books. But on the other hand, we have like a community on Instagram. So there is this discrepancy. There are some people who definitely visit us and there are some people who just visit our social media and don't go to the website. Uh, I think the book talk is uh, interesting inspiration and interesting to see how it works because uh, you can think, okay, people will going to watch some reviews on TikTok, reviews of the book. Do they go to the bookstore and buy this? Yes, they do this. Like, so uh, this is like different channels. Some people will going to stay and just watch uh, the the video and will not going to go on a website or to buy the book. But, uh, but some people do. And uh, I think what happened with the book talk is like uh, really amazing that there is like the very close connections. If you go in New York, in each big bookstore, you have the uh, the table, which is called Book Talk. And these are like the, the, and they promote, they sell the books which are popular on Book Talk. This is like in each, each bookstore, it's there. So it's not like these are completely different audiences. Book Talk very much reminds me of this uh, sort of 18th, 19th century literary fandom model, where the recommendation is not really a literary criticism, it's personal recommendations based on impression, emotion, sort of how it made me feel. So it, in a sense, weirdly, it feels kind of ancient or like traditional. Um, but I wonder whether Gerador, um have experience that they want to share because they work with um, with graphic design and multimedia in so many ways that makes my eyes water and I'm very, very jealous of them. So your publishing is so strongly integrated, uh, the written format with, uh, with graphic design and video, um, uh, video a bit more recently, and your events. Maybe you want to tell us about your experience because at least as much as I know, your audience is quite young. Your core audience is very young, right? Yes. Uh, basically, our audience is between um, 25 and 44, basically. Um, and yes, we do. We work closely with designers to complement our journalistic works with, with graphics. And... Uh, now that we are uh, doing a lot of also a lot of videos to our social media, we are doing video also to our journalistic works, but sometimes we don't have like a video input and we want to do like a video output to social media. So basically we work closely to uh, motion editors to animate our designs and to do like small videos uh, to our social media, to TikTok and to Instagram, but mainly to Instagram Reels uh, to uh, to empower our uh, journalistic works to get people to our website through our Instagram. Uh, a lot of people stay in Instagram and, and don't go to the website, um, but we, we still don't have the solution. And we also, we also see that uh, our videos are mainly like until one minute. The average, the, the, the average time that people see the videos are really smaller, like seconds. We are trying to 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 think uh, in this kind of content in a way that uh, um, we can uh, retain people uh, in the videos so that they get a, a more a proper uh, view of the the team of the journalistic work we are doing and trying to get them in the website so they can see the the entire journalistic work. But it's a challenge and we are trying to have more experience in that. I'm very jealous of how you guys are like very professionally and gradually integrating these types of content. Gerke, maybe you want to tell us about how the videos you work on, these NGOs you work with, how are they published? Are they 
usually published in an article in themselves? How are they? How do they find an audience? I think the Hungarian uh, uh, more like community was a little bit different than in other countries. Like in Hungary, audience is still on Facebook mostly. Maybe on TikTok really depends on what uh, like what's the target audience of the of the thing. There's that like, like one strategy: you just publish everything on everywhere. Like it has an old Vimeo channel. I mean, Vimeo was awesome. Like all the filmmakers love it, but no one else is there. <laughs> uh, so we migrated on uh, on on YouTube channel. But because our audience is on Facebook and Facebook. The algorithm is like uh, uh, more friendly with the uh, Facebook uploaded content. So finally, we just upload the uh, videos on Facebook too. But uh, on the on the on the on the on the website of this journal, then there's an article, and in the article there's embedded the, the video. What I like personally, I don't like because it could look it looked like the like the video was an asset or something else of the text. But uh, that's how we do there. And like if we do uh, some sort of political communication somewhere else, like with an NGO, like with Greenpeace, for example, where I usually work, then we make a line like first something goes uh, out on Instagram or in TikTok, and then later comes a, a, a longer and detailed content on first on Facebook and then then YouTube, I don't know. like. Yes, there is YouTube, but uh, there is no like big audience for Greenpeace, for example, in YouTube. And like, if the content is even more political, we make available the photographs and the raw footage for for other journals, and we edit something for ourselves. But it's not a very detailed uh, edition of the thing. It's just like super short. It tries to be catchy tries to be on Instagram. Yeah, so what you say about embedding the videos in the article, that's a, that's an issue that we at Eurozine have been um, sort of trying to observe. Our experience, the talk show that we produce, is similar to what you seem to have an issue with, and that is that the readership of the article does not really match the video viewer. So basically very few people open the video within the article on the website and way more people watch it when they find it on an existing platform. Um, both because they probably didn't really come to a sort of very structured journal that barely publishes videos. They don't come over for a video, but uh, they probably, or, or at least in, in our previous experience, there was more interest in the podcast format because as a, you know, I don't really like this expression, content consumer, but that's what you are in this case. As a content consumer, I think podcast is more akin or a closer step from an essay or a sort of traditional article than a video. Itself. We also do it many times, like uh, uh, upload the video finally on as a podcast on uh, on Spotify, and it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do the same. Although we we do publish now the podcast versions with the Cultural Broadcasting Archive, this Austrian initiative, which uh, you can of course sort of uh, affiliate stuff uh, with Spotify and whatever platform from there but they are a, an open source um, and fair use service provider based in Austria. And we work with them in the display project, but that's kind of the same logic there. Could you just say the name of the Romanian, the fantastic Romanian journal you mentioned? Uh, they are called Scena No, and they do have some English language publishing. And you can find quite a number of articles from them also in Eurozine, if you search for them as a partner yes. journal. Okay. For instance, they contributed a lot to our most recent series on um, food and water systems. Yes. And they looked into, say, the price of tap water and uh, water infrastructure altogether. So they're pretty fantastic. And again, a reminder to those watching who are not aware, Eurozine Network Partners 
exchange a lot of their publishing uh, freely between each other. Like we do, we ask for each other's content, but we translate and we publish a lot within the network because there is so much worthwhile published across these languages that doesn't necessarily reach an international audience. And this exchange really fosters the kind of debates that we want, want to do work in academia or publishing in the first place for. Yeah, there's one thing what I wanted to talking about. I think the budget of the filmmaking is all the time is a key point. So I think it's really important to think about it in details before you start to produce videos. If it is like we are talking about some series or some like long-term uh, film or video content uh, creating project, I think it's good to have options to change the budget uh, when it is already on the way. Yeah, the, the the feedback and to rethink it constantly is very important. Also in the terms of budget and also in the terms of how, many, how much energy you invest into video content creating. I think when, when producing video, one, a couple of things that should be taken into consideration significantly. But one of the things that very few people actually think about when archiving or building up, you know, storing material is the, the archive itself. So it's a lot of infrastructure. It's a lot of hardware, loads of expense. And the bigger the archive you build, the more room for failure. And what I would suggest, or I, what I used to suggest uh, when working specifically as a contractor videomaker is please always consult a professional before you put something down in a project budget. Not even, not even just the budget, just when planning your project or maybe multiple professionals, even if you don't plan on working with them long-term, they're going to be happy to spare that, you know, half an hour to talk with you just so that they spare the the eventuality that they may need to work in ridiculous circumstances and not because you're dumb or anything just because this is a field this is a professional field that like technologically changes even within a year so the the technical requirements what what we think of as acceptable quality or format changes so fast that there is basically an infrastructure arms race in the video field this is very heavily exacerbated by the platforms themselves. Google and Facebook are the main culprits there. I, for me at least, working in these networks quite like the Come Together project or with your zine or with Display Europe, this is a huge perk that you always will have a couple of colleagues who are happy to talk with you. So I don't know how encouraging this uh, discussion has been so far. But if you want to get started and you're interested in a few things, I'm pretty sure that um, especially um, these very experienced uh, social media colleagues on this call would return an email to you. But if you found anything that we have said so far uh, relevant and want to discuss a project idea of yours, we're happily at your disposal. And we are planning to see you in Warsaw at the project conference on 11th to 13th of October. And we will be shooting video at the conference and we do have to shape our plans how to go about this in an economical and professionally sensible way. Thank you everyone. And we see you very, very soon. If you have any, any last questions, you can either ask them in the chat or hit us up via email. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, hope Thanks to see so you. Much. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.